At this point, can we just all admit that the animators of Kaguya-sama Love is War is just flexing? Like, we had that amazing flex back in Season 1 with the whole Chica dance. But this episode, it had another moment that was very reminiscent of the Chica dance, but there was just so many moments throughout the episode, honestly, just scattered here and there, that straight up just was a flex for animation. Like, I can really see the passion and love for this series just within this episode alone. I mean, it's been very clear since the very beginning when the first episode of season one of Kaguya-sama Love is War came out that the animators really do love this series. They love working on it. The voice actors love working on it. It has just been front and center since the very beginning. And honestly, you know, I think it's been very obvious. But just this episode really just shows the love the studio that is working on this has for Kaguya. Because, I mean, just seeing Kaguya do the whole, like, you know, reflex, like, you know, trying to get a routine with putting her hand on her cheek to make her feel comfortable and less stressed or, you know, worrying and all that, I was just like, whoa, just seeing that whole animation sequence just blew me away. There was just so much movement within Kaguya's character, her moving her arms around, she felt so lively. And I think not many really appreciate just the level of detail and quality that Kaguya-sama's animators do. I mean, when you just see that scene, many might just say, oh, that looks really cool, you know, she's dancing, it's cute, all that. But when you just really take a look at it and just see the movement of the characters of Kaguya literally doing different positions and stuff, you're just like, holy crap, like, the people that were working on this really put a lot of time into that. They spent hours upon hours working on that, refining that motion with the characters, and I just gotta say, props to them for the work of that scene. But like I said, it's not just seeing Kaguya do that little, like, dance sequence and all that. We also have the se section at the beginning of this episode of seeing Miko actually having this whole, like, you know, misunderstanding talking with her friend about how she views the student council and when you see the backgrounds and the character expressions the movement it looks straight up movie quality like I thought I was watching a movie for a second I don't really understand the parody of that scene I know it's definitely from something I can definitely tell by the way the first se sequence of the episode with Miko kind of explaining the situation to the student council is definitely from something I know it's a common trope or theme within stories but I do know the way that was presented definitely had to be a reference to something there was a lot of references in this episode I know for a fact were there, but I didn't fully understand. I mean, they even have a very, very, very shocking reference that was a reference to the Peanuts, you know, comic in America, and I was just like, wait a minute, there is a literal Peanuts, you know, like, comic reference. I'm just like, there's no way. Like, I, I can't believe I'm seeing something like this in Kaguya's home. I thought the Dark Souls reference was crazy, but seeing that is even more over the top than I ever expected. But getting back on point, though, the movie quality of the first sequence speaks for itself, too. I mean, Miko was just oh my god, like, she was beautiful, and then the background scenery as well, to the character movement, and I mean, there was a lot of character movement in this episode, like, you have, let's say, Shirogane, you know, with the moving of his fingers, Ishigami, you have, you know, Kaguya, there is a lot of movement with the characters' hands, and I think that's incredibly important to give a lot of immersion and life to a series. This episode, honestly, is spectacular, like, even if it didn't have, like, good comedy or anything, this episode stands for itself just for the animation alone, for how good it is. But okay, let's uh, let's get on topic. Let's let's talk about the content besides just animation, but let's just talk about some of the things that are building up within this episode. And the first thing is that I want to talk about is the Ishigami stuff. Ishigami is one of my personal favorite characters. He's amazing. Like, I love all the characters in the series, honestly, but Ishigami, I like him. He's very different than the other cast members of the story. Miko's very different, which we have been introduced to, and I love her, you know, overall, uh, like, role within the story, but Ishigami is also very different as well. He's someone that's very open, very honest, but at the same time, he's more, I guess, reclusive. He's someone that kind of stays away from all interaction. I mean, he, he pitches in and says what he wants to say, but overall, Overall, he's kind of like Isley. He's a loner, basically. And this is a character that he, or he's been this type of character since the very beginning when he was introduced. And kind of seeing him within this episode, we see kind of a different side to him, showing that he's kind of opening up as a person and wanting to do things that he normally would not do. Example, him joining the cheerleading squad. Now that... 
that threw me for a loop because he even admits himself that it's something that's just the complete opposite of what he is. Like, he is someone that is a loner. He's someone that doesn't do, like, group activities to be a normie, etc. He's someone that just likes to chill and do his own thing, play games, chill in the student council room, etc. You know, he's a, a guy that keeps to himself. And seeing him join the cheerleading squad is just something that's completely off the wall that you would never expect. But then, when you look at it, he's trying to fit in a little bit more. He wants to kind of be a little bit more normal normal and someone that kind of is more open to others and doesn't feel like he's just a loner always by himself. Even though he does have the student council, he does need to be able to interact with others as well. So he joined the cheerleading squad to kind of you know, change his ways a little bit, change himself as a person, which I think is just beautiful to see. He's taking steps to try to be a better person, so props to Ishigami for that. But, with all of that, I really do feel like this is a precursor to something incredibly sad and upsetting because like we are reaching closer and closer to the conclusion of Kaguya-sama season 2 and with all anime usually there needs to be some form of conflict and crazy final episodes of a series before its inevitable conclusion even for let's say a season 1 season 2 etc and I feel like with what is being built up here it's probably going to be something that's going to be really relevant to the conclusion of season 2 because like Ishigami joining this club and then you know he's meeting with people he really is not talked to trying to be normal etc and they are all having like a you know a cross-dressing get together i feel like this is like a recipe for disaster something bad is about to happen and i i don't really know exactly what i mean it's very clear that it didn't seem like the cheerleading squad was manipulating ishigami it didn't seem like they were trying to make him cross dress him and they were just going to leave him high and dry be by himself i feel like there might be a misunderstanding though i do think that maybe if they were talking about it maybe it was just a joke or something and they weren't really taking it seriously but they didn't mean it in you know i guess a bad way they didn't have ill intentions for ishigami but I feel like maybe they were joking they weren't really going to do it, and maybe Ishigami took it in the wrong way to try to really change and be together with another group, and obviously I feel like something bad from that is going to happen. I feel like he is going to go meet them with that meetup, they're not going to be cross-dressed, they're not going to be in different outfits, etc., and it's going to result in him being made fun of, people are going to take pictures, they're going to call him a freak, you know, they're going to probably just say he stole something, it's, it's going to lead to a lot of problems, even if Kaguya comes out and says that she lended him her, like, outfit, it's going to lead to a lot of weird suspicion and eyes onto her as well, and then Shiragane, and it's, I, I feel like this is definitely building up to something incredibly sad and upsetting with Ishigami, I don't know, I just, I have that suspicion because of the way this episode was presented with that final sequence because Kaguya-sama doesn't normally leave on cliffhangers. It doesn't. It, it usually does not. I mean, we do have, you know, the episodes continue, like the events continue over and carry on, like the whole boxer brief stuff, and I really like that with how Ishigami definitely had boxer briefs, which carries over with the beginning jokes of this story with the looter jokes and all that. I, I really appreciate that. I really do appreciate how that had a lot of continuation. But the point, though, is, is that we don't normally have you know episodes cliffhanger like this episode did and I feel like this is incredibly important because of that that's leading into something with the finale of season two so I'm excited I really am excited to see where it's gonna go but besides what potentially is going to happen I gotta say I really do like that sequence with Kaguya and Ishigami and the whole her helping him out and dressing up etc I gotta say, it's hilarious, honestly, but also very sweet to see Kaguya help him out, because Kaguya and Ishigami, we know their track record, we know how they are, and there's a lot of misunderstanding with Ishigami and Kaguya, but I do think that Ishigami and Kaguya are really close. Like, usually when they do interact, there is a lot of close scenes between them, with either Kaguya helping him out with studying, and, you know, her, him wanting to take her to, let's say, you know, the aquarium. There is a lot of things between the two characters that it shows they're close. They do care about each other, and just seeing that brief little scene just shows they're great friends and Kaguya does care about him she's not weirded out about Ishigami he has a true friend with Kaguya and I think he really does appreciate that and you know he knows that Kaguya is not really making fun of him he you know she does accept him for who he is it's a beautiful and endearing scene I, I really appreciate that final sequence so okay um let's talk about Miko so Miko had a major spotlight within this episode which I think is just outright hilarious because like she tries to talk about how the student council is very 
very impure, messed up, oppressive, etc. And that entire beginning sequence with her talking about how the student council is, you know, it's kind of like, Miko, don't you realize this is kind of how you are? You're wanting to repress the student council. You're wanting to make it to where people can't be in close relationship or proximity to, like, you know, a male and female. I'm just like, do you understand that what you're saying in your, you know, imaginations is exactly what you want to do, but was pointed out that, you know, you need to understand from other people's perspective. I'm like, it's funny just how much her perspective shifts within her mind, but then it's not just that as well. She starts talking about the looter actions of just, you know, Kage and Shiragani and how they interact in the student council and all that, and you just see how she's like, I'm very pure. I don't want something like this. I'm just like, when you look at Miko's mind, her mind is probably easily the lewdest and darkest out of all the characters. I mean, Chika's up there. We don't really know if Fujiwara Chika is with her mind, but I mean, when it comes to everyone else, though, Miko is definitely very up there. Her imaginations are incredibly wild, something that's just like you don't see from other characters, and I'm finally starting to understand kind of what Miko's character really is. Besides her just being the audience, she's also someone that brings more of a looter side to Kaguya-sama love as war, misunderstanding. She brings a whole different element of, let's say, comedy to the story because of her, and just seeing how she is presented as this pure individual, but then you see how her imagination is. She's easily the ones that are probably the most corrupted and dark out of all of them. I mean, the imagination she had about Kaguya and Shirogane and, you know, how Kaguya was like, you know, a mistress, etc. I'm just like, it's very clear that her mind is very, very very twisted, and I'm just like, I didn't expect something like that, especially with the whole Fifty Shades of Love that was said. Now, that one, I like how ironic that is, how ironic her saying Fifty Shades of Love is actually in reference to, you know, the movie slash book, and I'm just like, her saying she's pure, but then that is a reference to her, I'm just like, okay, okay, it, it's very clear what, you know, it's trying to say here about Miko, is that she looks pure, but in reality, she is not. Which, speaking of which, there is something that was presented that I think is incredibly important with the whole Miko scene that I think many are not going to talk about, and that is the little flower that she was given. Some, you know, genuine kindness that was given to her, not with any ulterior motive, etc. She talked about it within this episode, and apparently this is something that she's talked about for a very long time now. She said it so many times to her best friend, in fact. She's like, I've heard it time and time again, ten times plus and all that, which shows that Miko really holds that little gift, that little flower, very close and dear to her heart. And I do wonder exactly who gave that to her. I feel like that's going to be very, very relevant, and I feel like it's going to be ironic if it turns out to be Ishigami. I, I have a feeling that's probably the case. When we look at Ishigami and Miko's relationship, it actually makes the most sense. I mean, let's think about, you know, Miko being kind of introduced in the story. Miko kind of got help thanks to Ishigami, because Ishigami kind of stepped up, talked to Shirogane to help out, etc., about her flaw and all that, and I feel like Ishigami silently has been helping her out behind the scenes, but she's unaware of this, and maybe he's an admirer of her, he likes her, whatever, but I feel like maybe that flower is from Ishigami, and, you know, she is just completely unaware of it, because, you know, it's not something he wants to, you know, brag about, he's just like, I was just trying to help someone out, I don't like to see them suffer, I feel like he's the one that gave it to her, and maybe the person she admires or loves is Ishigami, but obviously the way she treats him is hilarious because it's the exact opposite of that. I, I feel like that is where the story is going with that little detail to Miko's character. So this is a fantastic episode for a variety of reasons, and I do think that, once again, this series, it just keeps getting better, one-upping itself every single episode. I really don't know how it does it. I really don't know how Kaguya-sama Love is War continues to make better and better episodes as it continues on. But I'll leave it at that. I love you guys. You have a wonderful day or not wherever you live. If you enjoy my content, you know, please subscribe. If you like this video, please leave a like. And with that, Chibi out.